Welcome everyone. I see a couple of people are still joining, so we're going to give them a few more minutes to get settled and we're going to start very soon. Okay, awesome. It looks like we have a lot of people on board at this moment. So I'm just going to go ahead and start um, our session today. Um, hello and welcome to the first installment of the Better Buildings discussion series. In this series, Better Buildings and DOE laboratory scientists will be providing updates on relevant research and technology, addressing frequently asked questions by buildings operators identifying opportunities to enhance energy efficiency, and discussing lessons learned from the pandemic to build resiliency. I'm your moderator, Mariana Ejea Casalduc. I am an ORISE Science, Technology, and Policy Fellow in the Commercial Buildings Integration Team within the Building Technologies Office. I'm also the new healthcare sector lead with the Better Buildings Program. I wanna thank you all for being with us today. We have a wonderful session prepared and some fantastic speakers. We are going to introduce them in just a moment, but before we dive in, I'd like to go over some brief housekeeping items. We are currently in a meeting, so you're welcome to turn your webcam on. However, we do ask that you keep your microphone on mute until the portion of this session, um, until the discussion portion of this session. If you are having any trouble with your Zoom features, please chat our technical support using the Zoom chat feature on the bottom of your screen. All questions from our, uh, for our panelists will go through Slido, which we will introduce in a moment. And please note that today's session is being recorded and will be made avail available on the Better Building Solutions Center. And we will stop the recording prior to our discussion. As I mentioned earlier, today we will be using an interactive platform called Slido for polling and Q&A. So please go to slido.com using your mobile device or by opening a new window in your internet browser. Today's event code is hashtag DOE. If you would like to ask our panelists any questions, please submit them at any time throughout the presentation we will be answering your questions near the end of the session. You can select the thumbs up icon for the questions that you like, which will result in the most popular questions moving to the top of the queue. Now, we're going to start things off with a few polls so we can learn more about you. Um, please join us over at Slido to respond. Okay, I see these are formulating. We have partners from state and, state and local government, higher education, multifamily housing, residential as well. Great, thank you all so much for answering. Leave that there for a couple of, a few more seconds. A couple of people are still getting their answers in. Okay, I think we can move to the next poll. The question is, did you consider or conduct building commissioning or retuning as a first have a couple of yeses and a couple of noes or 50-50. 
That looks great. I think we can move on to our next question, next poll. And it says, are you using fault detection and diagnostics to track the problems and the persistence of your changes? Going to stay on this question a little longer. Okay, I think we can move on to the next poll. This question reads Have you adopted measures? And then you can click all of the ones that apply, and those will populate. The options are promote social distancing and face covering, increase outdoor air ventilation rates. We have increased filter rating in HVAC systems, and then install additional filtration and ventilation equipment. We can move on to the next poll. And this question reads, what is the greatest challenge to bring occupants back into buildings? First option is insufficient knowledge and guidance, insufficient, oh, the cost to implement IAQ measures, shifting knowledge and guidance, and then in insufficient trained staff to adjust building operations. And we have other, that, that option as well. Going to stay on this question a little bit longer. Okay. I think we can move on to the next poll. And then this is an open ended question. Which topics would you like to be discussed during future webinars? Please be honest and take your time answering this very important question. This is your opportunity to let us know what possible uh, tech-related questions um, you might have so we can work on answering those for you all and making sure that our resources um, meet your needs. Okay, we already have a few responses and we have the best way to keep your staff safe. That's very important. Most effective allocation of resources when making decisions, very important as well. Energy impacts of ventilation and filtration. Collaboration on the local and regional level. Thank you so much for answering this. 
we're going to give you guys more time on this one. Finding the balance point between IEQ and energy savings specific to COVID protocol. Okay, I think we're gonna move on. Um, please note that you'll be able to submit questions through Slido throughout the entirety of the presentation. So there's still a lot more time to, to uh, ask the questions that you have. So wonderful. Thank you everyone for answering all of these questions and uh, let's move on to our presenters. So our first presenter is Ian Walker. Dr. Ian Walker is a scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. He has more than 30 years of experience as a building scientist conducting research on indoor air quality, ventilation, and reducing the energy and carbon impacts of buildings. He is an ASHRAE fellow and is the chair of the US National Residential Ventilation Standard, ASHRAE 62.2. He also serves on standards and technical committees for ASHRAE, ASTM, ResNet, and other national and international organizations. He leads the LBNL team working on US DOE efforts on IAQ in homes and international efforts with the IEA's Air Infiltration and Ventilation Center. He currently serves on the residential team of the ASHRAE COVID-19 Epidemic Task Force. Our second presenter is Lou Harmon. Lou Harmon is the Director of Research and Consulting at Mason Grant. Much of his work over the last 40 years has concerned humidity and moisture control in buildings and industrial processes, along with related phenomena which are affected by humidity and moisture, such as indoor mold, HVAC systems, and the drying rates of materials and structures. Lou has served as a national peer in the Construction Excellence Program of the Public Building Service of the U.S. General Services Administration. He is well known as a writer and lecturer in North America, Europe, and Asia. Lou is a fellow and life member of the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, ASHRAE, and in 2018, he was inducted into the Indoor Air Quality Hall of Fame by the Indoor Air Quality Association. Thank you, Lou and Ian, for being with us here today. As a reminder, please send in any questions for our panelists through Slido by going to slido.com and typing in the event code, hashtag DOE, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we possibly can. At this point, I would like to pass things off to Ian. So Ian, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for those introductions, Mariana. So, I just want to emphasize that, that today I'm not going to talk about anything medical related to COVID-19. I'm strictly going to be thinking about and discussing with you the interaction between COVID and buildings and what we can do about building management to address some of the issues that we have. So if you go to the next slide, um, I guess a, a good question is, you know, what do we know about COVID transmission? How might that relate to buildings? Well, we know it's transmitted by a virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And basically every case we see in the literature that's been studied has basically been transmitted indoors, sometimes in vehicles. So when we look at where people are getting infected, they're getting infected inside buildings, which is why buildings matter. Uh, it's initially a respiratory infection. In other words, it's something that uh, at least initially is affecting you through your breathing airway. And why is this important? Well, it's important when we try to think about how people get infected. And they're infected by virus droplets and particles in the air that infected people um, breathe out. And there's a little illustration I provided there uh, in the slide that sort of gives an idea about this. 
And we have to understand a little bit about what happens when we exhale particles. The, the very largest particles we exhale basically fall out very quickly from the air and smaller particles remain airborne. Uh, and we have to deal with these in slightly different ways. We're all very familiar with this guidance about keeping six feet away from people and wearing a mask. And that's to reduce the risk in this exhaled plume. And from a building's control point of view, we, we can ask people to wear masks and keep distancing, but we can't really deal with these very, very close distances in terms of building controls from the perspective of things like ventilation and filtration. Uh, go to the next slide, please. So a tricky part is that if only people um, had symptoms, as soon as they were infected, it would make it much easier to trace. We could tell people, stay at home from work if you're feeling sick, or if you have children who get sick, don't send them to school. Unfortunately, we do know that people are most infectious before they have symptoms, which makes it a much, much bigger public health challenge and difficult from a building's control point of view, because we can't simply tell people to don't come in the building, whether it's an office space or a school or what have you, if you don't feel well. So we are going to have to use building management strategies to deal with this. And the risk is definitely higher if you have more people and less ventilation and filtration. So the number and density of people in a space is really important. And where can buildings have the biggest influence is really, as I said a minute ago, sort of outside this initial plume from people. It's these airborne particles that are floating around in the air. And we're going to assume here that you've taken precautions about distancing and, and, and mask wearing, and, and that's what's gonna take care of that near plume, but it's what's floating around in the air that buildings can really address. Um, but in order to sort of understand that a little better, if we go to the next slide, I did wanna talk a little bit about why we think masks are, are so important. And really there's a couple of things that's, that are important to understand here. One is if you wear a mask, the actual velocity of air that gets expelled and how far it goes into the room and your chances of that jet of air impinging on somebody else are much lower with a mask. That is a really, really important thing. Whether the, the mask is removing a lot of particles or not, you're simply putting less particles in less air. It also filters particles that you breathe out, particularly the large ones. And we'll get back to particle size in a, in a moment or two here. And probably the, the, the last or least important aspect of mask wearing, unless you're in a very specific healthcare situation with an N95 or better mask, and have got a mask that is fitting tightly and you've been measured and it fits you properly. The fact that it's also filtering out particles is important, but probably less of a factor than the other two. So this is why we recommend mask wearing so much. And if we go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about particle size and why this matters. On, on the left there, there's a little squiggly picture of a virus. It's about 0.1 of a micron in diameter. Um, that's not really the focus of things we're concerned about. Um, viruses don't survive very long if they're quote unquote naked, if they're just floating around on their own. And frankly, in terms of how bad an infection is gonna be, it depends on the number of viruses that you actually ingest. And an individual virus on its own is very unlikely to cause an infection. But if you breathe in a larger, larger particle, a larger particles can contain a lot more viruses, then your chances of an infection go up. In other words, bigger particles have got a bigger risk. And the little picture on the right there is showing a, a large bubble of respiratory fluid that would contain many, many more viruses to just an individual virus um, on its own. And roughly it goes, if the engineers in the audience would be familiar with this idea that as you increase the size of a particle, its volume, its capacity to contain viruses goes up like with the cube of the diameter. So if something is 10 times bigger, you can carry a thousand times the amount of virus. And the current, a lot of current research is focusing on getting a, a bit more detail into that, but that's sort of good general guidance and, and, and having some knowledge about particle size is very important when we think about how to deal with these particles in terms of uh, building controls. And in terms of, this idea of what's happening far away from somebody. So you imagine the big particles falling out of the air or you were wearing a mask, but the small particles that are floating around out there. Um, we're thinking about particles generally bigger than half a micron in diameter. That's the size of interest we care about. They can contain a lot of virus and they're commonly expelled by people. And if we go to the next slide, 
again, why does this matter? A smaller particle remain airborne longer. And um, generally speaking, for the range of particles we're talking about, the measurements that we've seen in, in various field studies have shown that about half the particles disappear in about an hour in the air. That's what I mean by the half-life. So every hour that you wait, about half the particles just fall out of the air or the virus becomes inactive. The size matters because it uh, determines where it goes once it enters you, where it goes in your respiratory system. Smaller particles go deeper and there's some evidence that going deeper into your lungs uh, might result in more serious infections, although you can definitely be infected uh, in the upper airways also. And from a building's control point of view, it's, it's good to know the particle sizes of interest because it'll tell us what sort of air filters are gonna be effective. And we know from looking at the particle sizes that people emit, that something like a MERV-13 filter is gonna be really, really good at removing the particles of concern. But you could also maybe use a MERV-11 filter and get some sort of reasonable removal. In other words, if you can't put a MERV-13 filter in, you can still have some risk reduction by using a, a lower MERV filter. So we don't always have to be perfect. We can still get some pretty good results, even if we don't uh, do, the, do the best uh, you can imagine. So if we go to the next slide, um, I wanna talk about sort of three basic principles about reducing risk in buildings. The, the first one is, kind of obvious, this idea of source control or isolation. If you can isolate infected, infected people or isolate sensitive people away from potentially infected people, that's a good idea. There's a, these ideas about airflow direction. You really wanna exhaust air from contaminated rooms and supply to rooms that have sensitive people. You're trying to maintain an airflow direction from uncontaminated spaces or rooms to contaminated rooms to outside. And of course, well, we already know that wearing masks and keeping physical distances, that's a good way to have some sort of first level of, of isolation. The second is to di dilute by ventilation. If you ventilate more, you lower the indoor concentration. So every breath you take will have fewer viruses in it. Similarly, filtration uh, also removes particles from the air. Again, this lowers concentrations. So every breath you take has fewer viruses in it and you're reducing risk. And by the way, these, these are not new for COVID-19. These are all things that have been known for a long time about controlling uh, spread of diseases that are, that are spread through the air. And in hospitals, they've been doing this sort of thing for a long time. So if you go to the next slide, let's talk a little bit about ventilation. Basically, this is just to dilute the indoor contaminants, or if you're exhausting, of course, you're removing contaminated air from the building. And how much air is enough is, of course, the key question. You all want me to give you a number of air changes an hour that will be perfect, and I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna tell you, you should ventilate as much as you can while maintaining comfort and considering energy implications, which is a horrible wiffle waffly answer. I'm not gonna tell you to go to 12 air changes an hour that's used in hospital isolation wards. It's simply impractical and you don't need it in most buildings. I will say you should at least meet the minimum air flows and the ASHRAE standard 62.1 and 62.2 cover these. And you could open windows uh, with a few caveats and so on. But I think that the bullet in red there is really important. And I, I saw that some of you had answered in the affirmative when we asked this question earlier. Um, it's really, really important to make sure you are getting the flows that you think you are getting and to maintain your systems. It's vital to commission your systems. And if you haven't done it recently, now is the time to do it. Let's talk a little bit about air filtering. If you go to the next slide, um, if you have a building with a central forced air system, we recommend that you put a MERV-13 filter in. That will, that will be really good. You don't have to go all the way to HEPA filtration, in other words. And even if you can't do MERV-13, if you can do MERV-11, that is still helpful. It might not be as good as MERV-13, but it's certainly better than doing nothing. As some systems only operate when you're heating and cooling. You will need to institute some sort of minimum runtime. Maybe it's uh, 10 minutes an hour or 15 minutes an hour when you're not heating and cooling. Otherwise, you're not removing the particles. Um, obviously. If you don't have a central system, you need to use some air, room air cleaners. I gave a couple of examples here. Um, the one on the right is a large uh, unit that will process something like 1500 to 2000 CFM, good for larger spaces. And the, um, the picture on the, on the left there is of a, of a smaller sort of household unit, which is maybe good for, you know, maybe servicing, say, 400 square feet, where the larger units go to several thousand square feet. 
it's still important to regularly inspect and change these filters. And um, you know, your your building staff need to use the appropriate PPE when you change filters because they there is a chance that as you remove the filter, some of what's deposited on the surface will go into the air again. So, but these are sort of standard um, safety controls. And although MERV 13 is fine, as I've said, almost all these devices that are used for uh, room air cleaning, almost all of them have HEPA filters. Um, and people have asked, you know, do you really need it? The fact is that almost all of them have it anyway. So it's not really something we need to debate. If we go on to the next slide, um, there's a lot of available guidance out there. I'm sure most of you have read some of it. I'm sure very few have read all of it and more and more is coming every day. And there's a lot of places to get guidance. And I would say if, if you're confused or you want some clarity, uh, look for trusted sources and who might they be? I, I think um, ASHRAE has done a really good job of providing lots of guidance. And I have the little graphic there. You can go to the ASHRAE site and they have breakdowns for uh, different types of buildings. A lot of it is very detailed from a sort of building manager perspective. It might be sort of over the top for some of you, but there's still some good information buried in there. Um, the CDC and state and local health authorities, of course, if your local health authorities have said, you know, these classifications of buildings will close, then of course you should follow that guidance. And how do you sort good from bad? Well, I gave those three basic principles earlier. And if you're trying to sort of sort out who your guides you're getting, trying to think about it in terms of those principles. Think about proven technologies. Is at least if you're getting rec technology recommendations, are there things that have been around for a long time and we know are helpful at removing particles? Look for third party certifications on technologies also. And, and ask, ask questions of, 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 of uh, yourself and anybody who's trying to sell you some technology in terms of how is this, how do you compare this to what I could simply do with my existing systems? If you go to the next slide, I have a, just a couple of remarks on some guidance might need some revision. Uh, this is specific to ASHRAE and I'm not gonna get into any details here. Probably we don't need to run systems 24 seven uh, if buildings are only occupied some of the time, that's probably not necessary, is a big waste of energy. There's also questions about pre and post occupancy purging. Um, really, if you, if you have um, you know, a whole bunch of people in a space, they leave in 20 minutes later, some, another bunch of people come in, purging is a good idea. The rest of the time, absolutely not. It does very, very little because you want to have clean air when the people are there, cleaning air when people are there and not reducing the risks. And I won't go into any more details here. I'm sure there'll be some questions on that. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, UV has been used quite a while. Uh, it works by damaging the DNA and preventing replication of the virus. Um, the key thing to know is for UV to work, it has to be a lot of UV. You certainly do not want it shining on you. And it works best in high frequency, high risk applications. This is not a DIY thing uh, because to work effectively, it has to be very powerful. So you need good engineered solutions. There are some that work in ducts. There are ceiling systems. There are new things coming up. I, I put a, an example picture here of a, a fan integrated system. Uh, in any case, always look for some certification, some sort of certification with these devices. They can be effective, but they do require careful engineered solutions. If you go to the next slide, um, another technology that's being promoted a lot is ionizers. And we have to be, uh, be a lot more cautious than we do about UV because their effectiveness is largely not proven. I'm not here to say they're not effective, but we just don't have studies that show that they are effective. Um, read the fine print. Um, Often the contamination reduction levels you'll see quoted are for very low flow rates, often single digits of CFM. And there's a bunch of studies going on right now to look at what happens at higher air flow rates. There's very little to no third party certification of them and no standardization for performance. If you are gonna use one of these things, uh, you should be aware that studies are ongoing about their effectiveness and look for ones that are certified ozone free. Um, you go to the next slide, um, this is actually blank because people often ask about, um, they've heard about humidity for control and Lou is gonna talk about that in detail. So I'm gonna say nothing. I will say stay tuned and see what Lou has to say about it. And we'll go to one more slide and then I'll be done here. Um, this is just sort of a summary to let you know, I've given you sort of an overview of what we do know. There's still things we don't know and there is ongoing uh, research to try and optimize some things. Uh, Lots of people have developed models of infection rates and risk reduction that allow you to manipulate things like ventilation rates and occupant density and put in better filters. And they are useful for providing guidance. There's uh, more work on looking at airflow in rooms. If you have large conference rooms, 
do we need to make sure we have lots of mixing in there or is mixing actually harmful? Um, there's some studies going on about that. Uh, we're refining information on things like relevant particle sizes. I gave you some general guidance on, on, on MER ratings of filters, um, but it would be good if we could say, you know, a MERV 11 is, you know, 50% worse than a MERV 13. I have to put some numbers on that. The studies of mask effectiveness, again, there's been quite a few studies in already, and I think it's kind of proven, but people are looking at trying to optimize that for materials and making masks, you know, cheaper, for example, if you could make them a lot cheaper and just make them readily available. And a lot more work on optimizing solutions. And these were, you know, go back to questions we raised at the beginning of this discussion, which is about cost effectiveness of different, different controls. If it's cheaper to filter than to ventilate, should we do that? And what are the various energy impacts and everybody, and you know, asking, answering questions like, at what point do we say, send everyone home from a school or an office building? And lastly, um, I did mention about ionizers, but there are several other technologies that are currently being laboratory and field tested that might be interesting solutions in the future where we'll, where we'll be able to provide much more definite uh, recommendations. And um, at that point, I will um, um, stop here. And, I'll, and if you go to the next slide, it just says, thank you for listening. And I'll be around to answer questions. And I believe Lou is up next. Wonderful presentation. Thank you, Ian. Next, we will transition over to Lou. Lou, please let us know when you're ready. Great, I think I'm, think I'm ready. So we'll, uh, we'll begin that. I believe I'm sharing my screen here. And we'll start in on the presentation here. There we go. Okay. So as Ian mentioned, um, uh, I'm going to be speaking about humidity. And uh, one of the interesting things about humidity is that it has been studied quite extensively with respect to uh, indoor air quality. Uh, and I'm going to share with you some of what we think we know. When I say we, uh, this is the group of, uh, of folks within the ASHRAE community, uh, within the, the building science community that have been looking at the interaction of the HVAC system and the building enclosure for quite some time. Um, I'm going to tell you that uh, basically you shouldn't worry too much about humidity. <laughs> So uh, when you hear somebody who's spent a long time in humidity uh, say that uh, what they're about to say isn't terribly important, you should probably understand where they're coming from. So I will just take a couple of slides to explain uh, my background and why it is that I feel this way uh, before I give you the evidence. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say initially that, that my background is uh, essentially in humidity control uh, for the 10 years after I left the Air Force uh, after university, I spent 10 years with a manufacturer of dehumidifiers and humidifiers. So that's 10 years of working with the equipment and applying it in all different forms of buildings. And then for the last 33 years, I've been an independent consultant uh, with a huge one, one person company, Mason Grant Consulting in, in New Hampshire, uh, uh, in humidity and moisture control and all of its forensic investigation and so forth. Uh, and then I retired last year, but it didn't work very well. Uh, I've, I've been an ASHRAE volunteer for very many years. And of course, all of us in the community have been pulled back as volunteers to try and help provide guidance to, to folks who are trying to figure out the best thing to do uh, in this pandemic. The, the career that I've had uh, began with industrial. So this goes to very low humidity levels. Uh, you can't make a lithium battery if there's any serious amount of humidity in the air very, very dry to be able to make lithium batteries. So that was 10 years of, of at the very low end of making sure that there was hardly any water vapor in the air. And then the next part of it was just a transition to commercial and institutional buildings uh, in 1992 with the beginnings of the mold, um, I will say the mold crisis in, uh, in, in, in North American buildings, uh, very much exemplified by what was happening in hotels and motels. And that led ultimately within ASHRAE to a group of us getting together to write the humidity control design guide, which speaks to all different types of buildings, uh, separate chapters on each one. Uh, and then later in 2006, the building as a whole, instead of just the HVAC system to look at it in a more holistic way. Then finally, in the last few years before I retired, I worked with the Environmental Protection Agency on guidance for air cleaning, uh, which turns out to be helpful in this pandemic and also moisture management. And then also uh, for the Ministry of Health in Malaysia, 
uh, which assembled a team to uh, develop guidance to prevent the kind of mold problems that they had in the 5,000 healthcare facilities that the government owns in Malaysia. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, what my thoughts are after 11 months, basically, uh, of looking at uh, COVID-19 and humidity uh, in a fairly serious and daily, uh, uh, daily attention to this subject, uh, it seems clear to me that, that humidity does affect survival time of most viruses in air, and I think that this is clear. Um, but when we talk about SARS-CoV-2, the, the, uh, uh, the virus behind COVID-19, uh, it's viable for quite a long time uh, in air, at least three hours and longer at 65% RH. Uh, and actually two days ago, we have uh, more laboratory research that suggests it's at least seven hours at 50, 53% RH. So it lasts for a very long time uh, in terms of its viability in air. And I'll show you some, some evidence of that shortly. The fact of the matter is, um, what we keep seeing is that the other factors for this virus, for this virus, which is so very infective, govern the transmission far more than humidity does. The viral load, which is the occupant density and whether or not they are discharging large amounts of their virus into the air. So occupant density and whether occupants wear masks. What is the dilution rate? What is the extraction rate? So it's the exhaust uh, of, of, of polluted uh, air, of contaminated air. And what is the dilution rate we can achieve with, uh, with, uh, with ventilation air as Ian suggested? And then finally the removal rate. So if we can't extract it and, and we can't uh, dilute it, um, or at least we can't do that completely, uh, we can continue to reduce the concentration of viral <laughs> cloud in the air, which is what we want. If we don't want viruses in the cloud. We can remove it using filtration. Um, the thing that is so convincing beyond the laboratory work is that if we look at the evidence of the worldwide infection rates during 2020, it simply does not support the theory that raising humidity to 40 to 60% reduces transmission. There are just so many other factors that, that hugely govern transmission other than humidity, and I'll show you some evidence of that. So um, we begin with this uh, uh, study uh, by Nielce van, van Dormelen, who works uh, uh, in the federal agency headed by, uh, by Dr. Fauci, um, and she and her coworkers are in the laboratory, I believe, out in Montana. And they did some very early work, as you can imagine, on a rush basis, uh, uh, but very comprehensive work because they've been looking at SARS-1 for a very long time. And they duplicated the tests and the longevity of SARS-1 for SARS-2, so uh, SARS-CoV-2, the, the current. And what they found um, is uh, that it lasts a lot longer on some materials and shorter on others. Its behavior is very similar to that of the original SARS epi epidemic, uh, the virus that was that was responsible for that. But what I'd like you to focus on uh, is the results that they found in the air as opposed to the surfaces. Surfaces are important, but as we know now, air is extremely important, especially when we're talking about whether or not it would be a good idea to raise the RH. Uh, to focus on that, we'll look at this. Um, and by the way, I should mention that all of these uh, references that I'm describing here are available to you uh, as handouts, um, you can uh, uh, go to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the archive there, and I believe you've all been been provided with a uh, with a copy of of the link to that to read these for yourselves. But if we look at this and we look at aerosols uh, along the left hand axis, uh, we're looking at the concentration, and you'll note that it's logarithmic. So there are big changes in each one of those divisions order of magnitude change on each division. And then the time is along the bottom. So for SARS-CoV-19, uh, uh, the, uh, the current virus, which is in red, uh, that really uh, lasts for a very long time. Uh, yes, there's an order of magnitude, perhaps reduction over three hours, but we still have two orders or three orders of magnitude to go before we get to zero. So if we wait, for humidity at 65% RH to inactivate the viruses, it's gonna be a long wait uh, and not probably not something that, that we're gonna to wanna to tolerate. 
On the other hand, we can do a really good job uh, with ventilation and filtration as, uh, as Ian pointed to. So if we look again at the evidence there, and we'll speak now of, uh, of Drs. Yang and Marr uh, back in, in 2011, what they were looking at, because they did see an effect of humidity uh, with respect to extraction of viruses, um, uh, but what they what they show in their in in their paper is that you can get rid of viruses pretty quickly if you're going to do a lot of ventilation. So, for example, if you were up as high as ten air changes per hour, uh, that would be a lot. Uh, but if you did that, uh, you could probably get rid of them in about uh, about twenty twenty five minutes or so. That's really quick <laughs> compared to waiting for humidity. And even if you were so unfortunate as to only be able to manage one air change per hour, really, you could still accomplish that even, even under the work circumstances in about two hours, in about 120 minutes. Again, much better than, than the waiting for, for humidity to do any job of inactivation. We just get rid of those little, little guys uh, so that they're not in your breathing space. I think it's important for everybody to keep in mind, though, that all these things that we're talking about that Ian has mentioned and that I'm mentioning now, uh, they're not going to keep you safe. They're going to reduce your risks. And that's really important for building owners and managers and especially occupants to understand is HVAC is not going to keep you safe. It would reduce your risks, and I, I, I was struck by the uh, by this cartoon here from uh, uh, from Dilbert here uh, a, a couple of weeks ago as I was preparing this presentation. Uh, the boss asks whether or not you've tested everything to make sure it's 100% safe. Notice he's, he is wearing his mask as Dilbert is, and Dilbert explains uh, to the non-technical professional, nothing is 100% safe. We don't live in that kind of reality, um, and then the. Uh, uh, he knows, however, that the boss would like him to say that anyway, uh, but really, as the boss points out, it's really more about the blame layer. So HVAC is not going to keep you safe, but it can reduce your risks. So let's look at that. Um, number one, most effectively, uh, you can reduce the size of the viral cloud. The number of droplets in the air can be reduced if you're wearing a mask. If you're not wearing a mask, then... There's no attenuation of the amount of, uh, of, uh, of virus that you are likely to be expelling as you speak and as you breathe. And recently, uh, recently in the last six months and especially in the last four, we have wonderful work. This one is from Dr. Seema Asadi. Uh, she, uh, she and her group at uh, UC Davis out in California did this work. And then she ended up at MIT uh, doing slightly different things, but she shared some of this data with, with us, uh, which is tremendously helpful to keep in mind. So what we're looking at here is um, the test data uh, from her uh, group's research on people wearing masks. So this is not just one person wearing a mask or a dummy wearing a mask. This is several people wearing a mask, three replicate runs. And what we're looking at there uh, is the attenuation that happens with three types of masks, a surgical mask, a KN95, not an N95, but a KN95, not quite as effective. And then just a two layer cloth mask, as you can see in this picture. Uh, in these pictures. So if we look at just plain old um, uh, uh, talking, just speaking, the attenuation rate from a surgical mask is really terrific. It's just great. Uh, and even a KN95 is, is good. And even a two layer cloth mask, if you are speaking, you're still, uh, you're still uh, uh, imposing a resistance that, that effectively uh, gets rid of about 55% of what would otherwise be expelled into the air just by wearing a two layer cloth mask. Uh, and then if you're breathing, just simple breathing, the attenuation rate is a little bit different because your breathing is not, you're not expelling as many. So the ratio of what you would expel to what is, is expelled changes, but the bottom line is that they're all about the same. So, you know, it's, really tough to argue with, 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 with this kind of terrific uh, uh, attenuation and, re and reduction of the risks due to the uh, amount that people are putting into the air. And then let's take a look, look at this uh, in the real world. We'll move from the laboratory to the real world. And I'll take the example of Taiwan and we'll compare Taiwan to Florida. Uh, they are both humid climates. 
quite human. And they had substantially different records of infection and substantially different records of deaths to date in this, in this pandemic. If we look at Florida, um, and what you're looking at here is a graphic representation of the weather. Uh, and the, the, the pink area shows the, you know, the, the hours of the year when, uh, when, when it's really uncomfortably humid uh, in Florida outside. It's quite, quite humid. And we'll note that the population in, in Florida is roughly 22 million and the area is about 66,000 square miles. Uh, and then uh, we have to face the fact uh, that we have to date uh, about 18,000 deaths uh, due to COVID-19 in Florida as reported by the, by the Florida authorities. If we look at Taiwan, which has a population of 24 million, so slightly more people, uh, and an area much smaller, about 14,000 square miles, so much more dense, very similar highly humid climate for many hours during the year. The deaths to date in Taiwan have been seven. That's not 7,000, it's not 700, it's not 70, it's seven, as opposed to 18,000 in a similarly humid climate. So I think um, if we look at the, at the evidence, uh, both from the laboratory and also from the, from the history of infections, I think we can say that humidity really is not the sort of thing that we ought to be focusing on. Uh, let's take a look at, at uh, whether or not masks make a difference. And again, we'll look at some anecdotal, uh, but there's emerging uh, peer-reviewed science on this as well. But we'll just take a look at one anecdote here that uh, popped up here back in, in, uh, in August. It might partly explain uh, Taiwan's Taiwan's success, because as I'm sure everyone here is aware, there's a cultural um, uh, affinity for uh, for wearing masks in, in Taiwan. And here is uh, the the record of a of a rock concert in Taiwan during the pandemic with at least 10,000 people. And I think that we can say, as we look at this image, that yeah, probably most people are wearing masks, and that might possibly explain it. I'll finish up by, by asking the question, well, you know, why not humidity anyway? Uh, well, the biggest reason not to worry about humidity is that there are more important things to worry about, and that's what we should all worry about. But if you wanted to do humidity, where would the risks be um, if you did humidify to ranges that, that some people have suggested, for which there's, again, no evidence of effectiveness. But if you did, you'd be looking at the highest risk where it is the coldest for the largest number of hours. So the IECC, the International Energy Conservation Code, climates six, seven, and eight, uh, which is, as you'd expect, the northern tier of the US and Canada. Um, also, the highest risks are going to be in buildings that are not airtight and well insulated. And I'll give you an example here from Climate Region 4. This one is from the Washington, D.C. It's from the Renwick Gallery, uh, diagonally across from the White House uh, in Washington, D.C. And what you see is condensation dripping from behind that painting. The painting is on the north wall. And the, it, the environment was humidified many years ago as part of a HVAC retrofit uh, to 70 degrees and 50% RH. Trouble is, the area behind that painting, which is uninsulated and it's a north wall, reaches the dew point temperature of the air, and therefore we end up with condensation dripping down behind the painting. This was the subject of an article published in the ASHRAE Journal um, a number of years ago, 2004. Uh, it was solicited from the from uh, by, from Dr. Mecklenburg, Drs. Mecklenburg and Tumosa at the at the Conservation Analytical Laboratory, the Smithsonian, and they were specifically warning against HVAC retrofits to high humidities without careful thought about the building enclosure. So um, there are health risks uh, to uh, higher humidity uh, because there are risks of condensation. And this is something that within ASHRAE where we've been studying for quite some time. And you can, um, uh, in your handouts, take a look at the results of that work. Uh, in damp buildings, human health and HVAC de design, which says that if it's damp over time, it's gonna be a problem. And then on the equipment side, one has to be careful to make sure that the water does not, does not stay or remain stagnant because then the population of Legionella in the reservoirs will go up. Legionella is with us everywhere in water systems. So you don't want it to grow and therefore be a bigger problem. In summary, I would say, don't bother adding humidifiers unless there are other reasons to do so. 
Uh, you want to minimize occupant density and maintain a distance between occupants. You really want to make sure that occupants are wearing masks because that's the primary uh, line of defense. Uh, fewer viruses, fewer risks, lower risks. You'd like to ventilate with outdoor air to the limit of the HVAC system and certainly provide MRF 13 filtration and uh, in all recirculating air handlers, uh, 11, 11 if that's not possible. And then finally add portable HEPA air cleaners where central MRF 13 is not possible. So I'll leave that up for just a second, but uh, I think uh, with that, I will uh, stop, uh, stop showing my screen here and turn it back to you, Mariana, for, uh, for further discussions. Thank you for sharing, Lou. That was a great presentation. At this time, we're going to begin taking questions from the audience using Slido. So we can transition over to Slido right now to see what people are asking. Okay. I'm gonna start with the question that's on top and it goes, do you have any suggestions for how long it is necessary to flush the building when using MERV 13 filters? Um, Lou, do you I wanna give that, that a shot? I think that's an Ian, Ian question. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it. So yeah. you can think about it this way. The, the MERV 13 filters are gonna be probably 95% or better in terms of their effectiveness of removing the particles we're worried about. So all the air guilt that goes through it uh, basically has a huge, huge reduction of particle concentration. So how long you run the fan for in order to do that depends on how big the space is that you are trying to clean and the airflow rate through the fan. Um, the engineers on the call will probably have heard of a term which is clean air delivery rate, which is uh, tells you how much clean air comes out the other side of the filter. And there are some simple calculations that would tell you if you know the volume of your space, and you know the airflow through the filter, you can calculate how long it takes to move all the air volume through the filter and clean the air. There's a couple of complications, of course. One is if you're ventilating at the same time, you're also reducing particle concentration. Uh, you might be bringing in particles from outside that are not virus related, but that's a story for another day. Um, and furthermore, it depends on how many people are in the space. If the space is empty, of course, you clean the air right away and then the air is clean. But if there's a lot of people in the space, they're still emitting, right? And so you would have to run a lot longer uh, to, to, to keep the air clean. And more generally speaking, you would run for some minimum amount of time. And you, there isn't one answer because it depends on how big the space is, the occupant density, the airflow through the filter. You have to do actually do some calculations. And there are some online calculators available to do that and others in the literature. Great, thank you, Ian. So we're gonna to go to our next question, which goes, are there low cost options to test particle concentration or ventilation filtration effectiveness? Um, the short Ian. answer is yes. People are developing uh, sensors specifically to detect this virus in air, but they're purely experimental. You can't go out and get one right now. But because we know that the particle is transmitted, sorry, the um, virus is transmitted in particles, and we know roughly the particle size distribution, there are low cost ways to measure particle concentrations. And while not perfect, because it's not measuring the truly measuring the virus concentration, it would be a really, really good guide. If you if you have air with very low particle counts in it, you've probably removed almost all the virus. And there, yes, indeed, there are low cost options for doing that. Um, even ones that are available, you know, for home use and so on. Some of those devices have some pretty good particle sensors in it. Great. Now, our next question is a water question. So it reads, our agency is planning to set all sensor toilets and urinals to pre-flush in addition to the standard flush as a COVID-19 response. Is there any reason to believe this would reduce the risk of transmitting the virus? Well, uh, I don't know, Ian. I, <laughs> I'm not sure that either one of us has a, has a strong uh, basis of experience by which to judge that one. My own reaction is I don't think so. But um. <laughs> well, I mean, there is there is something to this, right? We, we do know that um, if you aerosolize what you've deposited in the toilet, you will put the particles in the air and breathe them. That that's for sure. And we know that the virus 
uh, has been found and, and, and human sewage, right? I mean, it, it's, it's a real thing. Um, I'm not sure what is, is the question about purging the actual bathroom itself, or is it about flushing the toilet twice? It wasn't quite clear to me. My, my recommendation is shut the lid on the toilet when you flush. That's the biggest single way to reduce the amount of particles that actually come up in the air. And yes, I know in a lot of public restrooms, there's no actual lid, which is unfortunate. But if there is one, close it. Um, other than that, I can't really give very much more advice. Any other thoughts, Lou? No, I, th I think the same thing. I, I, I think, you know, in, in the scheme of things, uh, probably doesn't hurt. On the other hand, uh, uh, probably much more important things to think about <laughs> since we know that the primary is, uh, is transmission person to person uh, in occupied spaces. So my own feeling uh, without a lot of data behind it is that that's a distraction. <laughs> Okay, we're going to go to one more question, um, which reads, could you expand on why purging the building isn't a good fit for school? Sure. So um, the, the purging I'm talking about is there is this advice to purge the building both before and after occupancy. If you purge after occupancy, you're cleaning air that no one is breathing. Uh, so it doesn't alter the people's exposure. It has no impact. It's not reducing anybody's risk. You're just burning energy to purge the air. Um, I have heard the argument that, well, maybe there are custodial staff in the building who are cleaning it or security staff. And that is true, uh, but they should be wearing, if you're cleaning, you should be wearing full PPP, PPE anyway. You should not Absolutely. be cleaning without a mask under any circumstance. Yeah. So that's the post purge. The pre purge has the same issue. If, you're, if the building is unoccupied for more than 12 hours, the virus is continually either dying or falling out of the air at the rate of about, it's half-life, like I said, it's about an hour. So if you wait 12 hours, you're down at 0.02% of the initial concentration. And trying to purge that tiny amount, it, we probably couldn't even measure it, to be honest with you, at that, because you're at so many orders of magnitude below where we started, that again, you could do it, but it won't have any effect on the concentration of particles that people might breathe which is why I made the note that it is a good idea to purge. I'm thinking of examples like, um, if you think about houses of worship, okay? Uh, we've talked about this a lot uh, on the ASHRAE, various ASHRAE committees. So you have a group of people in a space, they all leave and then 20 minutes later another group in. A, a movie theater is the same way. Purging between events then is a really good idea. But if the space is gonna be empty for many hours and nobody's there to breathe it, it has no effect. Excellent. Thank you so much. I feel that with that, we're, we're about done with our questions for today. Um, as I mentioned, the recording and slides will be made available of today's presentation. If you would like to dive deeper into today's topic, we encourage you to visit uh, the resources listed here. Uh, we also encourage you to visit our newly renovated COVID-19 Resource Center. Here you can learn from the experts with resources like ASHRAE, resources from the EPA and other resources from the DOE and more. View resources by technology type and watch webinars or register for the upcoming virtual learning opportunities. We do hope to continue this discussion series. So in the meantime, we hope you will join us over on the monthly webinar series where we have a great lineup of sessions through April, 2021. With that, I'd like to thank our panelists for taking time to be with us here today so feel free to contact our presenters directly with additional questions or we couldn't get to your question during the Q&A period. I also encourage you to follow the Better Buildings Initiative on Twitter for all of the latest news. You will receive an email notice when the archive of this session is available on the Better Building Solutions Center. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>